Whenever we think of the figures that change music history, our mind tends to veer toward musicians for obvious reason. The people making and singing the songs that become part of our culture are obviously those with the most direct impact on it, but they're not the only ones leaving their mark. Behind the scenes of every great musical success, there are movers and shakers, people who spotted the talent in the first place, people who nurtured it to help it flourish in an industry that can often be cruel and cold. And of all these movers and shakers, there's one whose legacy looms large over the music industry. His name is John Henry Hammond Jr. Hammond was one of the true giants of the music industry, working for more than 40 years as a producer and talent scout. Throughout that illustrious career, Hammond discovered or worked with many of the greatest talents in music, and found himself behind the scenes of some of the most transformative moments of American cultural history. Hammond's influence was so large that I don't think it's enough simply to say that he was one of the most important talent scouts, or one of the most important producers of all time. I genuinely do not think it's a stretch to say that John Henry Hammond Jr. stands as one of the single most important figures in the entirety of music history. Let's take a closer look. John Henry Hammond Jr. was born in December 1910 to a family of almost unimaginable wealth. His great-grandfather was William Henry Vanderbilt, once the single richest man in America, and that fortune passed on down the generations to Hammond's mother, Emily Vanderbilt Sloan, who enjoyed life as a socialite among New York City's turn-of-the-century elite. In addition to various philanthropic endeavors, Emily Vanderbilt Sloan was a music aficionado, having grown up playing piano in the church. She tried to raise her children in a house of classical music, starting a young John Hammond on piano at just four before switching him to violin at eight. But while he was receiving a classical education, the young Hammond was sneaking away to give himself a different sort of musical education. Hammond spent much of his childhood in the basement of his family's Upper East Side mansion, listening to the songs sung by his family's black servants. This created a spark of interest in black music that would soon grow into a roaring blaze. In 1923, while on a family trip to London, a 13-year-old Hammond took in a musical show called From Dixie to Broadway. In a time where minstrelsy and blackface performance was still the norm, From Dixie to Broadway was a show that displayed the musical talents of black performers, including a cabaret queen named Florence Mills, and multi-instrumentalist Sidney Bechet, who's one of the most important soloists in jazz history. The highlight of the show was I'm a Little Blackbird Looking for a Bluebird, an upbeat number that yearns for the freedom of racial equality. Taking in this show was an absolute turning point in the life of a young John Hammond. When his family returned home from their travels, he started to seek out every jazz and blues record he could. This search inevitably led him to Harlem, which was in the middle of a cultural renaissance. It's kind of funny imagining this white teenage scion of the Vanderbilts skipping classes and sneaking into Harlem jazz clubs. And it's an image that definitely has some questionable power dynamics at play. Hammond was operating from a place of immense privilege here. His family wealth came from the railroad and shipping businesses. And well, it's kind of unclear whether his ancestors owned slaves or not, the fact that it's even up for question is incredibly relevant to this discussion, and there's no debate that his family profited immensely from industries adjacent to the slave trade. But of course, Hammond couldn't really control being born into wealth. He could only control what he did with his privilege. And as he came into adulthood, Hammond genuinely tried to use that privilege to platform black musicians and advocate for the black community. After spending his adolescence in Harlem jazz clubs, Hammond dropped out of Yale at 20 years old to pursue a career in the music industry. One of his first endeavors on this front was personally funding the recording of stride pianist Garland Wilson. From there, he threw himself into the role of producer and found himself in the booth with some of the greatest jazz musicians of the day. He worked closely with Fletcher Henderson, a band leader and arranger who was legendary within Harlem, but had a hard time breaking out beyond the New York scene. He also recorded Benny Goodman early in his career, and helped facilitate a relationship between Goodman and Henderson. Hammond allegedly even convinced Goodman to shift his music toward the emerging style of swing jazz, a choice that would soon launch Goodman into the stratosphere. 
Once again, we bump against the complicated legacies of American music here, as Benny Goodman was able to break through the American mainstream in a way that many black artists weren't. But Hammond wasn't just pushing white musicians into the mainstream. He was an active force in convincing Goodman to integrate his band. It was at Hammond's urging that Goodman brought on the percussionist Lionel Hampton and pianist Teddy Wilson, making his outfit one of the first integrated jazz bands in American history and putting a serious dent in the music industry's color barrier. The 1930s were an incredibly fruitful period for Hammond and his many collaborators. He brought Count Basie to national attention, discovered Charlie Christian, one of the most important electric guitarists ever to live, and organized a series of Carnegie Hall concerts called From Spirituals to Swing, which introduced many of New York's white elite to the rich tradition and history of jazz music. The whole time, Hammond was serving as a board member for the NAACP, helping to fight for the civil rights cause on a political front as well. He was also an important investor in Cafe Society, the first racially integrated nightclub in America. The greatest of Hammond's triumphs in this era was one of his first discoveries. In February 1933, John Hammond was planning to scout a singer named Monette Moore, who ran a speakeasy in a Harlem basement. As it turned out, Moore had been called out for another gig last minute, and had brought in a replacement— an elegant teenage singer named Billie Holiday. From the moment Holiday took the stage, Hammond knew he was witnessing something special. He remembered the moment in a 1973 interview with Ed Beach. I was just absolutely overwhelmed. She had an uncanny ear, an excellent memory for lyrics, and she sang with an exquisite sense of phrasing. I decided that night she was the best jazz singer I had ever heard. As it turned out, most of the music world agreed. Hammond brought Holiday in to record with Benny Goodman, and within a few years, she'd become the most beloved jazz singer of her era. By the end of the decade, Holiday was playing her own role in the fight for civil rights, debuting the legendary protest song Strange Fruit at Cafe Society in 1939, a moment that some point to as the catalyst for the modern American civil rights movement. Throughout the 1930s, John Hammond established himself as one of music's great movers and shakers, and as a dedicated ally to the cause of civil rights, all this while he was still a young man himself. If Hammond's career had ended then and there, he already would have been one of the most important figures in American music history. But it didn't end then and there. Hammond stepped away from the music world for a time, serving in the Second World War, going through family turmoil, and raising children, one of whom would go on to become an acclaimed blues guitarist in his own right. But in the late 1950s, just as a new storm was starting to brew in American music, Hammond returned to work with his longtime employer, Columbia Records. Hammond was living in Greenwich Village, where a new scene was starting to grow around American folk music. One of the key figures of this movement was Pete Seeger, who had been a national icon in the 1940s before being blacklisted under McCarthyism. Hammond was a longtime supporter of the same leftist and unionist causes that Seeger championed. He signed Seeger to Columbia and helped the musician find work again and assume a role as a senior member of a budding folk revival scene. The renewed interest in American folk music meant the environment was ripe for Hammond to shine a spotlight on an artist he'd been championing for decades. Ever since the 1930s, Hammond had been touting the importance and talent of a Delta blues musician named Robert Johnson. Originally, Hammond had hoped to include Johnson in his Spirituals to Swing concert, but when he sought Johnson out for the show, he discovered the guitarist had already died. Nevertheless, Hammond played two of Johnson's recordings on stage in the show. As the interest in American folk music was stirring in the 60s, Hammond oversaw a reissue of many of Johnson's recordings, in the form of a record called King of the Delta Blues Singers. In the modern age, we can sometimes take for granted how easy it is to find music, but in the early 60s, music distribution was still very localized. Robert Johnson records were not easy to find. Half the songs included on King of the Delta Blues had only ever been released on 78 RPM records before Hammond brought them to light. The album wasn't exactly a smash hit commercially, but it circulated around the Greenwich folk scene, becoming a favorite of hipsters and budding musicians alike. Columbia's distribution also meant that King of the Delta Blues singers found its way across the Atlantic and into the hands of a generation of young guitarists in England. Those guitarists included the likes of Keith Richards, Jeff Beck, Eric Clapton, Peter Green, and Jimmy Page. 
musicians who would go on to start the British blues revival and eventually define what rock music looked like in the late 60s and early 70s. But there's one figure who Hammond advocated for that might have had a bigger impact on music history than anybody we've spoken about in this video, and indeed may just be the most important musician of the 20th century. In 1961, John Hammond was sitting in on a recording session with Carolyn Hester, a Greenwich Village folk singer. Hester had brought in a young fellow folk singer to play harmonica on the record. He went by the name Bob Dylan. Hammond saw something he liked in Dylan and struck up a friendship, signing him to Columbia Records and giving him an advanced copy of King of the Delta Blues Singers. Before long, Hammond was in the studio producing Dylan's first album. The album failed to sell and had Columbia Records executives telling Hammond to cut Dylan loose. But Hammond stuck to his guns, much to the ire of executives who started to call Dylan Hammond's folly. For better and for worse, Hammond was a product of old New York money, which meant he didn't often take no for an answer. Jazz critic Otis Ferguson described his personality. John won't compromise on anything because he never learned to, and he never learned to because he never had to. Hammond told Columbia that they could drop Dylan over his dead body, and went to work on the second album, released a year later. Unlike Dylan's debut, that album consisted of almost entirely original pieces of lyricism, pieces that displayed Dylan's poetic talents, as well as his vivid knowledge of the American folk tradition and his innate ability to tap into the culture of the moment. The freewheeling Bob Dylan blew up and catapulted Dylan into mainstream success, stirring up a counterculture around him and leading to him being dubbed the voice of a generation. Beyond Dylan's political and cultural influence, he was one of the earliest and most successful singer-songwriters in the modern framework, laying the groundwork for what we consider to be the default in modern music now. Dylan completely transformed the landscape of American culture and music. And while someone of his vision might have found another home, we can be pretty certain at least that Columbia Records would have cut him were it not for John Hammond. Between Billie Holiday, Bob Dylan, and Robert Johnson, Hammond is responsible for shining a spotlight on some of the most important musicians ever to live. And there's a dozen other artists that I didn't even get into detail about in this video. He worked with a young Aretha Franklin, advocated for Bruce Springsteen, and even after he had retired, he brought Stevie Ray Vaughan to Columbia Records. Hammond worked tirelessly to create his vision of a musical world where musicians of any race could succeed and collaborate. He used the field of music to fight for a political agenda and helped to shift American society in a considerable way because of it. But even with all this, he's far from above criticism. For all his work behind the booth, Hammond was much more talented at spotting and fostering talent than actually working the studio console. And the shadow of his family looms large over his career, something that was criticized by a number of jazz musicians, including the great Duke Ellington himself. In a 1977 autobiography, Hammond discussed his take on Ellington, claiming that Ellington's music couldn't stir people to dance, and suggesting that Ellington had, quote, lost contact with his origins. Which... Yikes. In Duke, A Life of Duke Ellington, an Ellington sideman named Rex Stewart made clear his distaste for Hammond. If you're black and don't kowtow to him, he won't have anything to do with you. As a matter of fact, he'll even try to keep you from getting work. For all that he did, Hammond was still an incredibly rich white man born and raised in a segregated nation. And for all that he pushed back against his time, he was still a product of it and he was a powerful figure in an industry that was deeply exploitive of the black musicians that he so adored. This was a criticism levied at Hammond by Prince in his 2002 track Avalanche, where he sings, Mr. John Hammond with his pen in hand, saying sign your kingdom over to me and be known throughout the land, but you ain't got no money, you ain't got no cash, so you sign your name and he claims innocence, just like every snowflake in an avalanche. Hammond was a major player in a deeply harmful industry, but also someone who dedicated his life to trying to change that industry for the better. It's a complicated legacy with a lot of nuanced aspects to discuss. But through all this, I think one thing is indisputable. John Henry Hammond Jr. was a man who changed music in ways that most can only dream of. Ultimately, and perhaps unsurprisingly, I think that Hammond is best described by Bob Dylan himself. 
In his memoir Chronicles, Dylan wrote of Hammond, He was a true American aristocrat. Didn't give a damn about record trends or music currents changing. He could do what he pleased with what he loved, and he had been doing it for a lifetime. This video is brought to you by Nebula, the platform that is helping creators reshape the online video world. Nebula believes that when given space and resources, creators are capable of making incredible work that can outshine even legacy media. And they've been backing up this belief with action, funding a whole slate of incredible original works in both fiction and non-fiction. Without Nebula, I never would have been able to make Polyphonic Magazine, my experimental series profiling smaller artists that I couldn't talk about on YouTube. Personally, I think that Polyphonic Magazine is some of the finest work that I've ever done, and it wouldn't exist without Nebula. And it's not just me. Lindsay Ellis has a great new original about John Lennon and Yoko Ono, Volksgeist has a fantastic piece on the wild world of danger music, and there's so much more to explore. Nebula just finished up a big overhaul and now features new category homepages, Nebula News, and a bunch of new fiction and nonfiction originals. If you want to watch any of these or help support their creation, you can sign up using my link at nebula.tv slash polyphonic or by clicking the link below. Using that link will help support me directly and get you 40% off an annual plan, which means you can watch all that original material for a little more than $2.50 a month. Nebula is a platform that I really believe in, and honestly, I think we're still in the early days of great things to come. So check it out now, support a creator-led ecosystem, and get access to a ton of really awesome content. And hey, thanks for watching!